a little different from what I said they'd do. Initially, I'd planned to rank all the areas from best to worst. However, the more I thought about it, it's, it just seemed like a totally insurmountable task, as a lot of areas are just even more mundane than the bosses, with very little to say about them. So I figured these parts would be very boring, plus defining where some levels end and others begin is tough, and in this list I've decided to in in group some areas together where it seemed appropriate, so instead I've decided to do the top 10 worst and the top 10 best, but in this case it's the top 15 best because I j just could not settle on 10. Um, and today it's the top 10 best areas. Uh, the worst areas, that's the dessert. And this is the main meal, and you need to have your main meal before the dessert. Anyway, I'll quickly go over my criteria. Basically, I'm trying to pick levels that, for me, gave me that quintessential Dark Souls experience. Levels with shortcuts, interesting settings, good balance of difficulty, etc. For me, the quality of bosses won't affect the quality of level itself, so I'm taking the bosses out of the level, and that has nothing to do with my picks, essentially. Having things that stand out as being especially unique will bump areas up as well. But I'm going to go down as saying that the mechanical design of the level is, in my opinion, the most important factor. Generally, I want to avoid levels that are essentially just one big loop with really only one viable shortcut, such as the High Wall of Lothric. Spoilers, it's not in the list. You also won't find any like linear in and out areas in this list, hence most of Dark Souls 2. As fun as some of these areas are, they're just objectively more fun or soulsy areas in other games. Simple as that. So let's just get on with it. Now, number one, and the list is in no particular order, we're going to go with Alien Lois. The third Dark Souls 2 DLC brought with it a great amount of level design. You know, aside from that, <laughs> the DLC was in fact incredibly solid. Now, some might say that this was a bad feature, but in my opinion, it was a great way of encouraging exploration. Basically, you do the level once, and at the end, you unfreeze a lot of the level that you've went past that allows you access to those parts. But it allows for a different experience the second time around. Uh, couple this with a fuck ton of hidden areas, lots of optional areas, a good balance of fun to difficulty. It made exploring this area, aside from the other area, a fucking joy. One other thing, the fact that you don't need to save all the Lois Knights and you can, in a way, choose your own difficulty for the boss, just, it's just a nice little touch, I really do like that. Oh, and did I mention just how fucking nice this place is to look at as well? And the fact that technically, you know, there's the boss right right at the beginning, it's the Invisible Tiger, and you can technically do that right at the beginning, I think that's really cool. Um, now, the only real downside is the enemy design. Like with all the Dark Souls 2 DLCs, a lot of the enemies are just humanoid and fairly similar to each other. It, it, from all the DLCs, like, the, all the DLCs enemies are kind of similar. Mixing up would have been nice, but yeah. Alien Lois, guys, def couldn't not, could not go on this list, right? So, number two, and again, we're talking about another Dark Souls 2 DLC, and for good reason. This level has an element that really no other level has, which makes it stand out as one of the best, in my opinion. The level is littered with these tall stone monoliths that you can raise and lower, leading to hidden areas or just for a tactical advantage in navigation. Like Alien Lois, it makes exploring this area really fun. The main set piece of this level is the giant pyramid in the middle that leads back to the start of the level. It's also pretty easy to get lost in this level, which is refreshing for Dark Souls 2, frankly. The only way you're getting lost in the rest of Dark Souls 2 is if you clod your fucking eyes out after seeing the disgrace that is Earth and Peak's entrance. With plenty of hidden areas and traps and puzzles, it really makes the level amazing to play in terms of gameplay, but it's also got this really grand scale of things with this area being a gigantic cavern that leads to a dragon after you explore a fucking pyramid. Uh, you can also beat up this fucking tree thing if you want, so that's pretty cool. So number three, and clearly I'm just hammering out some Dark Souls 2 levels right now, uh, taking Dark Souls 2 as a whole, it's a strange beast, right? It's level design varies from utterly, abhorrently fucking trash to literally some of the best in the series, although I'll let you guess what the ratio of these two metrics are. <laughs> anyway, Lost Bastille is one of the best levels in Dark Souls 2, and indeed Souls in general. It links to four areas, well, I mean, okay, let's be fair, it links to two areas, it's hard to say the Belfry and Sinner's Rise are really different areas, but still having two entryways is really cool, especially like a hidden one. The really cool thing about the level is how you can choose to do less of it you know, if you really want to. Also, there's lots of hidden areas and shortcuts, although I will say the shortcuts aren't as useful as they could be due to how many bonfires there are in this area. Really, I think this area would have uh, really benefited from like just one central bonfire. But, but anyway, if you choose not to do the boss, it cuts you off from getting to the Belfry, which I actually like as it's an element of choice and consequence that Dark Souls 2 sorely needed. 
One of the best things about this level is in the base Dark Souls 2 game is this pile of boxes you see here. If you come from the wharf side of things, you don't have access to the other side because of the boxes, but the observant player can use a bow to smash them and get access. This is something I fucking loved about this area, is it encouraged critical thinking. So, you know, this area just has it all for me, really, and that's why it's on the list. So, number four is Cathedral of the Deep. Now, one of the issues with Dark Souls 3 is it was good, but it doesn't really stand out in any way for a lot of things. This applies to level design. A lot of the levels are good, but they aren't amazing. Now, Cathedral of the Deep is one of these exceptions. It's such a great example of how Souls level design should be, as it utilises one central bonfire extremely well, with so many shortcuts to the point that a lot of them are just redundant. <laughs> but fuck it, keep the change, right? <laughs> but that's the thing. The, its shortcuts are actually useful, and it has a good balance of difficulty as well. I just wish this level had some kind of back entrance or something like that, but you know, that is more of a world design issue. It, I just don't see why it couldn't have connected to Farron Keep in some way, fucking hell from soft, it's just, it's just up the hill, Jesus Christ! Anyway, I mean, this level has, you know, it's no frills, you know, there's not many hidden spots or anything like that, aside from arguably Rosaria's chamber, but it's hardly hidden if there's a big fucking lift leading to it. Anyway, just this level, you know, what it does, it does very well with the central bonfire, you know, lots of shortcuts. It's pretty much exactly how Souls levels should be. So, here we are on our first Bloodborne area. And now this area really holds a special place in my heart, as it is a totally unique look about it compared to any other Souls area. It's tough as nails, to the point of being maybe a little too hard, but still. The main appeal for this area is, again, the central bonfire that essentially loops around on itself twice and utilises the central bonfire and its shortcuts perfectly. This area has a decent amount of explorable areas as well. Not as many as other areas, sure, but a good amount. It's odd, for as much as I really love this area, I don't have that much to say about it, it's just simply great. I suppose one downside would be that somehow we're expected to believe that this fight with the two whale things is fair in any way without a fucking shaman blade, but you know, whatever. Sure, okay, fine. So now we come to our first Dark Souls 1 area on the list. Could this be even a top areas list without Ariamis? I don't think so. And there's a reason this area is held in such high regard. For being a relatively small map, it's packed full of secret areas and places to explore for items. Those shortcuts to open are actually highly useful. A very good balance of difficulty. Visually, it's fucking great with a nice contrast from the rest of Dark Souls 1. It also, in my opinion, gains points for being very a, a very well kept secret, but I mean I suppose that has nothing to do with the actual level itself. And also has one of the best unintentional shortcuts in all souls, as well as a fantastic farming spot. Fucking get you a man's that can do both fam. Not only this, one you know, one other cool feature about this place is that you can literally skip it entirely by just running to the end. How can you complain? A level so good! That even if you don't have a single fucking shred of taste or human decency and you don't like it, you don't even need to do it. Ariamis has another unique-ish element to it and it's actually quite an open area. It, you can go back and forth between sections of the area quite easily with this big central courtyard that most of the paths lead back to. Which is nice as, you know, not many areas are like this. In fact, it reminds me of 4-1 um, in Demon Souls, but you know, just uh, better in literally every way. Well. I'm sure a lot of people are going to disagree with me here, but I think Blight Town is actually a really great area, in terms of raw conceptual design. The frame rate on consoles is inexcusable, but it doesn't make the area technically bad. Now, why isn't it bad? Well, simply because it's just so fucking oppressive. In terms of raw visuals and ambience, I still think Valley of Defilement wins, but only just. Blight Town is better because, as a level, in terms of gameplay, it's much more varied and has a lot of nice little things about it. For one, you can skip a lot of the effort of finishing by going in through the back door. Uh, by the way, this is that's a good bit of life advice, just in general. The actual layout of the area is varied, like I said, with the rafters and the swamp parts, but there's also a fuck ton of hidden items if you're prepared to explore for them as well. The pacing is utterly perfect, also. The, you know, the descent from the depths is just a fucking horrible experience, and when you finally reach the bottom for the first time and find that bonfire, well, I don't think I've had a bigger moment of relief in games, just in general. Frankly, I'd rather feel something than nothing, and Blight Town definitely made me feel fucking something, that's for sure. 
It, not only that, something I love about this area is the fact that it links to four other areas, like completely different areas in total, which is really, really nice. Oddly enough, this area doesn't actually have really much going in the way of shortcuts. I suppose technically the back entrance that links to Firelink is a shortcut, so it's kind of cool how its shortcut is also some weird secret route in it as well. So, I mean, if anything, it gains points for that, just in terms of, like with Lost Bastille, it gives you options in how you want to actually tackle the level, and I think that's very important. Okay, so I know for a fact people are going to disagree with me with this one, but hear me out. So this may seem like an odd choice, but the more I was thinking about it, I just couldn't keep this place off the list, as it does something highly interesting. It has its own built-in speedrun incorporated deliberately into the level. Allowing you to skip most of the level if you want to, or if you need to, or you know, if you're observant enough. Not only this, there are a lot of hidden elements to this level, such as the bonfire and the way you find some of the items by falling through the floor, and you meet patches for the first time in the game. And you have the whole, you know, him fucking you over thing and the blinding, inescapable rage you find yourself in when you fall for it. The enemies have a cool mechanic as well, with the skeleton enemies respawning until you kill the necromancers first. And I know so many people won't agree with me on this one, but I really do feel like this level maintains its freshness all the way into the last third of Dark Souls 1. So the Undead Burg has, in my opinion, some of the most indicative use of Dark Souls level design that we've seen yet. You fight to get to the first bonfire, and then you fight some more to get to the boss, and then after the boss is defeated, there isn't another bonfire. There's this tension, and then at this point anything could happen. You move on, see a giant dragon at the bridge, and then you don't want to retrace your steps. Then you get to the save point, you kick down a ladder, and oh, there's your bonfire, it's the one that you had earlier. I really wish that this concept was used a little more in later Souls games, and even then, I mean, when it is used, it's still not as good as this example. Now, honestly, I see this area combined with the parish, they kind of seem one and the same to me, and when you include it with the parish, the level design gets even better. You know, when you include the link back to Firelink Shrine and then add up that this area links to five other areas in the game, this could only be the work of some fucking madman or a genius. So, another Bloodborne area, and I feel that this is actually an incredibly underrated area by most people, but really, just think about it. This one area not only acts as a gigantic hub and connects to like seven different areas, but it's got really fantastic levels in its own right. The way you can skip getting the key for the gate by just paying blood for the key, or you can open it from the other side, uh, the sizable secret areas like the back alley and the workshop, this area is really fucking great. The only way this could really have been improved and held more weight was if you couldn't warp in Bloodborne and there was more gates and as you could progress through the game you could open more gates that makes getting about easier. That's what I'd have done but whatever would I know I'm just some cunt with an opinion. But regardless I think Cathedral Ward it just goes, well, I think most people wouldn't even be expecting this to be on the list but you know like I said if you think about it it's actually fucking amazing. So yet another Dark Souls 2 level and this is the last one I think but you know, Forest of the Fallen Giants. So this is the only other vanilla Dark Souls 2 level that I think is worthy of this list, and it is Forest of the Fallen Giants. A truly great example of how to do Dark Souls levels. When you have a large area, a central bonfire, you know, level design that loops back to the bonfire more than once, a fuck ton of optional areas. No, seriously, think about just how much of this area is optional, and it's actually fucking nuts. Two bosses, a secret way of getting to a new area, uh, the most challenging enemies in the entire fucking series, allegedly, and an endgame area that you need to come back to later on. Seriously, this level is so perfect, and fuck you if you disagree. The only way, and this is something that I wish that they'd done, is that this gate here, why there isn't like a fucking lever that opens up this gate and connects these two areas is completely beyond me. I just, I, I really wish that that was a thing, but aside from that, I, I, this area really is so good. If only the rest of Dark Souls 2 was like this in the Lost Bastille, I'd probably say it would actually be better than Dark Souls 1 if the level design maintained that consistency. So there's clearly a, a theme with this list and it's the DLC levels are all generally fucking amazing, which is both good and bad. At least you get your money's worth, but where is this experience in the base game fam? Regardless, the Research Halls and Bloodborne DLC is one of the most fucking unique levels that I can think of. I can't imagine the headache that this must have been to design and plan out, and in a way, it reminds me conceptually of Elium Lois, as you find your way up the tower that is the research hall, you activate a switch that raises the stairs by one level, essentially changing how you know you go up and down the entire fucking thing. 
which encourages you to go back and check out the places you might have missed. Personally, I feel like this is the, you know, the final form of the Duke's Archives-esque, which in my opinion is clearly based off Latria 1 when you think about it, style of levels. Even though this is nothing like Latria 1, but Duke's Archives is based off Latria 1 clearly, and this is based off Duke's Archives, so, you know, by the transit of property. I would love to see an even grander version of this in future Souls games if we ever get one. Think about, yeah, the stairs go up and down and turn. Oh man, that would be insane. But, you know, atmosphere, quests, level design, difficulty, you know, unique selling points, this area really has it all. But just imagine that the stairs also turned. Oh my god. So, heading into some Demon Souls levels now, and Latria might be regarded as one of the prime examples of Soulsian level design, at least De Gary would definitely say so. A truly maze-like level that frankly has never been recreated in scope since Demon Souls, despite some obvious attempts at recreating it. Uh, the level has uh, constant shortcuts that allow you to head to lower levels and uh, you know faster, but ultimately it is still a considerable grind to get through, and it's incredibly easy to lose your bearings and get lost. Which is exactly what we all want, because we're all fucking suckers for punishment, aren't we? The atmosphere in this area is really something else, and I'd go ahead and say it's exactly what I think FromSoft should have been attempting to recreate in pretty much every other Souls game for every area. Like, you feel incredibly lonely whilst playing Demon's Souls, but especially in this level. Uh, most Demon's Souls levels are pretty slim and optional parts or hidden areas, but, you know, there's enough here to satisfy. Also, can we just talk about like how the difficulty of this fucking area for being the third level technically is just insane when you factor in those stupid Cthulhu things. Now Latria 2 is good, don't get me wrong, but I think Latria 1 really stands out simply because of how maze-like it is and how long and just completely oppressive the level design is and really, like I said, it's not been recreated despite, you know, uh, various attempts at that particular formula. So, another Demon Souls area, and this area might possibly be one of the longest areas overall in Souls, aside from, funnily enough, Latria is a bit longer than it, but, you know, at least from my personal experience anyway, it's pretty long, and the way the level loops around itself, and it's such a battle of attrition for the player, it's really nice, coupled with the, the perfect shortcut placement. Not only that, once you go around the level and you think you're near the end of the level, it just keeps going for a while until you reach the boss. Truly soul-crushing shit. The real magic of this area is how a large portion of it can just be skipped if you come here later, you know, with magic that lets you survive the lava pool, which, you know, gives us a real Metroidvania feel, which is something that I really like about this particular interaction, it just adds a little bit extra to Demon's Souls, gives you that little bit, uh, you know, extra option when you want to speedrun it or anything like this. I, I, you know, I really feel like more elements like this should be incorporated in the Soul series. There are some of them, sure, but, you know, definitely a lot more kind of deliberate shit. You know, letting people take shortcuts or go through the game in various ways based on their builds can add a whole load of cool variants to speedruns. But regardless, I think 2-1 Stonefang Tunnel is a really, really fucking good area. So, although I said this video isn't, um, like, in order, I would say if I was going to put anything number one spot, I would personally say it's Central Yarnum. So, I mean, here we are, just the, the granddaddy of Souls levels. The sheer scale of this area is just incredible. It's huge, and it has a really unique feel to it in terms of its, you know, its layout. You know, the streets wind and intertwine. I really feel like every shortcut and path is used in a really good way to get about. Uh, I, def I definitely use all of them, you know, multiple times. And I really, you know, love the areas hidden behind boxes and the fact that you can do this level in such a way that you can level up and get new armor before the first boss you know, if you explore. It's really easy to get lost in this place, and that's what I like about it. It's so maze-like and oppressive in its construction. It also comes packed with two bosses. The only real complaint is that I wish it was more city-like in some respects. All Souls levels are very deliberate in their design, with, you know, pretty much fixed paths to go on. It would have been interesting to see a space that's a little bit more natural and doesn't have uh, horse-drawn carts and a road that is only one way to go and leads to a dead fucking end. You know, Maybe only I would care about such a detail, but it would be nice to have an actual city combined with Souls-like level design. You know, perhaps with a lot of NPCs that can be saved and intertwining quests going on. Regardless, I know I feel like I've praised other areas more, 
but it's just that this one area excels so much in what I consider to be the core of Souls level design. All the extra frills just seem unnecessary, it doesn't necessarily need all these extra places to explore or whatever because the core element of just getting about and the shortcuts and the scale of it, it's really so much better than fucking anything else. Okay, okay, right, so I'm doing this right at the end and I know I said top 15 but fuck it, you know, I, I just couldn't not include this thing, so look. The Dark Souls 2 DLCs are just fucking fantastic to the point that justifies buying Scholar just to play the DLC parts. And like the other two, this area does just feel like one giant area. And like the other two DLCs as well, just contains absolutely fantastic level design. This area just has so much going for it. Countless secrets, like seriously, there's so many secrets and hidden areas and quests in this fucking, like, one place. It's really nuts. Uh, amazing vertical level design with the lifts. Uh, and a way of making like a, a fire area feel unique, you know, three games into the series. Uh, pretty much spot on difficulty. It's, it's really hard to say anything more, Is basically everything about this fucking thing is perfect because the shortcuts you unlock are used because of how much exploration there is. And the shortcuts, not only that, like, lead to the secret areas, so it pretty much justifies their existence. Again, like the other DLCs, the only real gripe is the overuse of humanoid enemies, but Aside from that, it's really perfect Souls content. It really is astounding that five entries on this list is Dark Souls 2 levels, and god, I'm gonna get shot to fucking the comments because of it, but, you know, fuck you if you disagree, especially with fucking Force of the Fallen Giants and Lost Bastille. Alright, you know what, I'm just a bad person. Uh, right as I was just about to render this video, I realised that I've missed Irithyll on the list, and I, I, I physically couldn't leave this video. It's fucking 3 in the morning, I have work in the morning, and I'm just like, I can't leave this video without putting Irithyll on the list, because... And I know people are going to hate me for putting it on the list and not putting Anne Orlando on the list, but I do think that um, the first half of Irithyll, which would be the first half of Anne Orlando, is much better than the first half of Anne Orlando. And I don't think the rest of Anna Londo is enough to make up for how shitty the first part of it is. But visually, I mean, Erythel is magnificent. It really, really fucking went all out with this. Especially, like, the, all the blue tones. It looks so nice, like, the way you're running through the streets and things like that. And not only that, I mean, the level design is really fucking good. It loops around on itself twice, and the difficulty is absolutely spot on. Now, you need to put this stuff into context, you know, I mean... For certain Dark Souls 2 levels, perhaps, it doesn't have as many secrets, but for Dark Souls 3, it actually has quite a lot of secrets, as some interesting quests assigned to it, a decent amount of hidden items and things like that. But again, you know, I think that just visually and the atmosphere from this, just overall, Erythel is just so good, like, it just, it's so good in a number of ways that it makes it good enough to put on the list in my opinion, and I just, I just couldn't do it without putting Erythel on here. And I mean, let's be fair, Sullivan's a pretty good boss, and if you combine, you know, Erythel with Anne Orlando in Dark Souls 3, it kind of becomes even better as well, so, aye, just as a quick thing, let's just stick it on the list now. So, I feel like I'm going to save the end bit of this video for special mentions and reasons for omissions. Uh, that way they're technically on the list and they're, you know, in my mind, but they just weren't quite in, like, the top levels for me. So, okay, I'm just getting it. So, the first one is Ash Lake. I feel like Ash Lake would make most people's lists, and it was on here for a while until, honestly, I realised that Ash Lake excels in one aspect, and it's atmosphere. But that is about it, really. Visually and audibly, it's amazing, but gameplay-wise, which is my biggest metric, it doesn't really hold any weight. So, certainly, it gets an honourable mention, but it doesn't make the main list. Next is Sen's Fortress. I really need to give an honourable mention to really the only area that I can think of that is like Sen's. Uh, they never really seem to revisit the House of Tricks theme ever again, at least not to my immediate memory. All the traps made this a lot of fun to go through, but I know most people hated it because uh, they are weak and given how horribly hidden the top bonfire is, it's a, it's a good fucking job they made the Iron Golem as easy as it is, that's all I can say. I'd have loved to see a refined version of Sen's in Dark Souls 2 or 3 as well, which is the best part about Sens is getting to explore the paths the boulder trap makes, which is, uh, you know, outside the obvious path to take, so it kind of feels like you're in the inner workings of, like, a giant clock or something. Uh, whilst writing this, I realised that the Iron Keep is sort of a throwback to Sens, but personally, I'd have liked to have seen a Sens revisit that adds a lot more variety in terms of the traps that you need to deal with, or some kind of horrendous rotational mechanic where you need to deal with two randomised traps at the same time whilst facing enemies. God, I'm fucking sick, aren't I? 
Re regardless though, Sens didn't quite make the list simply because of just how linear it is, I suppose. Um, it's, it's really close to almost making the list though, so uh, you know, it's pretty borderline. Hence why I felt like I really needed to mention it somewhere. So, uh, Valley of the Drakes. Valley of the Drakes is such an important area, uh, an area that links four areas together, but at the same time, without this place, speedruns and alternate routes would be dead. But sadly, that's all it has. Uh, it's definitely something to mention, however. Next we have 4-1. This place gets a mention because, like the Painted World of Ariamis, it kind of does something unique in that it opens up into one big square area that you can explore in your own way, non-linear style. This is pretty cool, but as Ariamis is essentially the same thing, but incredibly better, it didn't make the cut. So, Anorlondo. Where is Anorlondo? I will be hearing everyone say, unless I address it. Look, it's good, certainly, but it's not as good in terms of gameplay as people say. It has two incredibly bullshit moments. Uh, overall, it's pretty linear. It does get better once you enter the cathedral, but it doesn't excel in any one thing especially well. It is an iconic area with... Uh, the best boss in the entire series, but it's not the best level. And definitely people are going to disagree, but okay, it's my opinion and uh, go fuck yourself. The Forbidden Woods. This was this was was on the list initially. Uh, quick shout out for being such a stupidly gigantic area. This was, uh, you know, gonna make the list, but felt like it was just needed to be cut in the end. I don't even have a specific reason for it either, it just didn't feel like it belonged. Possibly due to the overall being quite linear and, uh, you know, Bloodborne's lack of items made exploration kind of unrewarding for the most part. Uh, its shortcut is, you know, the, the, the lantern shortcut is kind of like a fake shortcut. I, I can't really explain it, but it's just, um, it, I don't know, like, they, they didn't need to be a shortcut there and they could just put a lantern there and nothing would really have changed. Uh, whatever. The Ringed City. So, don't get me wrong, the Ringed City is really fucking good. Like, really fucking good. But, I do have a slight problem with its level design. Um, it really only has fake shortcuts, which is something I noticed about a lot of Dark Souls 3. Essentially, you go on a straight path until you reach the central bonfire, but then it'll have, you know, another path that loops around back to that bonfire, but really, you know, you just go on another path. So, it appears like there's a shortcut, but really the initial loop was basically a straight line and you have no incentive to ever use this shortcut ever again. I hope people see where I'm coming from. Uh, it's certainly a lot better level design than simple linear levels such as Huntsman's Copse, but it's not quite the same as say the shortcut in Undeadburg, which you would use a lot to get back to Firelink. I feel like maybe the difference is that the Ring City feels like it's split up into a few big segments that are linear and once it's done, it's just done. Plus, I feel like there's something a little off in terms of difficulty. I just don't think copy and pasting 400 enemies into a swamp is really the prime way of going about it. Uh, I really, truly love the Ring City. Please don't get me wrong, but it's just, it's for its level design specifically. That's not why I loved it, and um, that's why it didn't make the cut. And like that, it brings me to the end of this video. So I'm gonna hit you with the usual bullshit, and uh, just I really hope you enjoyed this video, and I really hope you're looking forward to the next part in uh, this two-part series, I suppose. If anybody wants to hit me with any ideas for upcoming videos, I'm very well open. Uh, the time that I've been away, I haven't... A those videos that I am going to be doing, but, you know, I've not been giving it too much thought, so just, you know, hammer your suggestions down in the comments. Um, well, I give a massive shout-out to all the patrons again. Um, you know, like, I've been away, and you guys have really fucking genuinely saved me this past year, this horrendous year, but... Now, I'm back because of you guys, not just the patrons, but like, I wouldn't be back if it wasn't for you guys. I, it, more like I couldn't be back, actually. So yeah, I just want to give a massive thanks to everyone, and um, everybody should also join the Discord server as well, because uh, it's been really good fun, and people have been really enjoying it, and everyone's really active, and everyone's really good friends there, and it's probably the best place to communicate with us, so yeah, should get around to doing that. But with that, I'll love you and leave you, and I'll see you in the next part, and indeed any future videos. So I'll see you then, guys. Bye.